Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that we can all gather this morning. I trust that you are mostly dry or uh, drying. There's, there's blessing that comes in rain. There's sometimes an inherent risk and changes on our roads. And I understand that when that happens in mass, that it's considered not so much a blessing, but we can't bring the rain. So we'll take it when it comes like this. I'm glad we can all gather. My name is Brendan. If, uh, if I don't know you, um, I'd love to meet you outside afterwards, but I don't often get to, well, let's be honest, I forget to say my name all the time, but if you don't know me, welcome. It's me afterwards. But we're blessed to, to gather in the name of Jesus this morning. I welcome you if you're online as well. We're going to worship in many ways. We worship through music and song as we will in a moment, but we'll also worship in prayer and, and as we hear the word. As Dan said last week, uh, God is the star character, the main role in the Bible. And even in our gathering, he's the star of our gathering. Here's the reason we gather, is in the name of Jesus. I invite you to stand as we worship Jesus this morning. For he is good.
define good and you are our father our heavenly father who loves us created us smiles upon us Lord there's nothing we do that can deserve your love but in Jesus we are qualified In your nature, you, you love us. Lord, we are here with you. In your name, we give you our thoughts, our praise, our attention, our worship. You are worthy. Have your way this morning, Jesus. This is your gathering. We are your people.
Yes, God, we pour out our praise this morning. We breathe you in. As you are here this morning, God. Thank you for being in this place, for meeting us where we are, God. As we sung, may all the world shout your praise. God, we come here this morning to be filled by you. And we pray that at the end we would leave filled with your presence to go out into the world that they may shout your praise. God, we feel your presence here this morning. May you be at work in our lives. Great are you, Lord. You are so great. God, you are in everything. You are everywhere. And God, we want to lift you up and speak the name of Jesus into the conflict in the Middle East, God. God, you are great. We know that through you, miraculous things can happen. And we just pray for peace into that situation, God. Would you break into that situation of conflict and pain and war and death, God? Would your peace and your light shine into that situation, God? Would people encounter you afresh, God, for the first time? Would we see hearts transformed? Would we see people lay down weapons in pursuit of peace, God, for reconciliation that only you can do, God? Oh, we pray this in your name. closer to home, God, we just want to lift up the upcoming Queensland election. What can be a source of conflict amongst colleagues, friends, family. God, we just pray for a time of peace. We again pray for your reconciliation. We pray that you would be using the elected party for your glory, God. We pray that people would treat each other with respect and love, as we heard yesterday in the GLS, God. Above all else, would we treat people with love? Would your will be done in our state, God? Would your will be done in our community? And God, we just want to lift up those affected by Hurricane Milton in Florida, God. Those impacted by devastating winds, torrential rain, those who've lost houses, those who've lost pets, who've lost loved ones, who've lost everything, God. Would your church be at work in that community, God? Would people feel the love of Jesus in that situation, God? Through aid workers, through care, through support, Would your disciples be there to be a shoulder to cry on? We pray for a quick recovery. And we pray that your peace that transcends all understanding would be across our world, God. And God, we just want to lift up the Adams, Adam Lowe and um, and Adam Barkey as they're over in Perth delivering their final session. At, um, at the Billabong Church over there. We pray uh, that your word would go out, that you would be equipping leaders over there to equip more leaders, to equip more leaders, that your word may continue to grow at a rapid pray- pace that we couldn't even understand ourselves. We pray that you'd be at work over there, God. And God, we thank you for new life. We thank you for all the little babies joining our congregation. Thank you for being present in our situation, God. And we
we speak this all in your almighty name. Amen. Well, why don't you take a seat? Um, can we give a round of applause to our worship team? Didn't they lead us well? Well, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Real Life Christian Church this morning. If you're at the GLS yesterday, you may be thinking, I'm sick of this guy hosting. That is because the senior pastor thinks that I can get up on stage and people won't notice. Thank you. But no, my name is Isaiah. I'm one of the next-gen leaders here at Real Life Christian Church, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. Welcome as well if you're online. We're so glad that you're here. As always, there'll be a QR code on the screen behind me. Uh, I'd encourage you to pull out your phones, scan that. Uh, you'll see a bunch of links. That lets us know that you are here. Um, and it also has lots of information about uh, who we are at Real Life, uh, some of the events that are coming up, as well as opportunities to give if you'd like to do that electronically. Uh, we also have uh, letterboxes on your way out um, if you'd like to give in person as well. That's a great way to contribute to the mission of the church that we have here. Uh, you also see a button in the stream if you're online. If you are new here, you'll see people in blue shirts that say here to help, and they are in fact here to help. So if you have any question about what goes on in the life of Real Life Christian Church, they're here to be your, uh, your contact person. Ask them anything. If they don't know, they'll point you to someone who does. Um, after the service, there'll be tea and coffee as always. That's out in the courtyard. Um, and if you're new here, that's free. So go tell them it's your first time. Yeah, everyone loves free coffee. Dan sneaks them all the time. He's been new 20 times. Um, uh, if you are new here or if you haven't connected with our social media or e-news, um, that's the best way to stay up to date with what goes on in the life of our church. So you can subscribe to that via our website. Um, and we also have Pathways kicking off today. If you haven't done Pathways, um, it's a great way to understand what life is like here at Real Life, but also understanding uh, what your uh, unique creation from God is like and how you can serve in our community. So we have our first session today. Uh, it runs over three weeks. Some people have registered for that. If you haven't registered and you want to go to that, just walk out. It'll be in the studio um, across the, uh, the foyer, so I'd encourage you. It's a great way to learn uh, this first session about who we are as Real Life, so I'd encourage you to do that. We have... Um, the Logan Collective Prayer and Worship Gathering coming up, and I'm going to invite Nathan to the stage, who's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Why don't you make him feel welcome? How many of you were at GLS yesterday? Great. So you'd know what Craig Grishel told me that I can do. It's this thing called permis permission to obsess. For those of you I haven't had the privilege of meeting yet, my name's Nathan, and I'm the worship pastor here. And uh, one of the things that I obsess about is this whole idea of gathering. Now, you might say to me, but I'm not musical, and uh, singing and that sort of stuff is not really my thing. Guess what? That's not what this is about. Can I obsess over the thing that is at the core of who I am that plays out in the role that I have, and that is encountering God? Obsessing over encountering God. We talk as a worship team that there's three layers. There's this idea at the middle, the core of everything that we do as a worship team, which is encountering God and growing in our relationship with Him. Outside of that, we talk about community and relationships, which is what we get to do here as a group on Sunday, is build community, build relationships. And then as musicians, there's this outer shell that we talk about, which is this whole idea of the skills that you develop, the things that people see when you're here on stage. But if you don't have a core that is encountering God, then you've missed the mark. In your own life, whatever you do, whatever people see on the outward ring, at the core of it all needs to be this idea of encountering God. So I don't care if you come along to something like this and do not sing a word. If all you do is stand in God's presence together, because he promises where two or more are gathered, there he is in the midst of them, stand in his presence together and obsess over encountering God. That's what I encourage you to do. That's what this is. And we get an opportunity to realize that we are not just part of something that's happening here, but we are part of something that's actually happening right across our city. 
And that is so exciting. We are just one expression of God's church right here. There are churches meeting today right across our city, all sorts of flavors, all sorts of denominations. God's intention is that in each of these places we would encounter God and we get to do this together. The people who come here are amazing people from all sorts of different churches. Come and join with us tomorrow night. I encourage you, I implore you, put aside whatever else is on your agenda. I'm obsessing over this. I hope you will as well. Amazing. Thank you, Nathan. Well, there was a little bit of foreshadowing in the prayer today. I'm excited to share that um, BJ and Fiona welcomed little baby Sebastian recently, which is exciting. Um, And to wrap uh, notices up, we have baptisms coming up next week, which is exciting. Um, And are there any further classes for that? That if you uh, want to get baptized or want to explore what that's like, you can chat to Pastor Claire. So we are going to move now. There are lots of people at the GLS, um, but we want to hear from some of the people uh, who were there and who got stuff out of it. So I want to invite Lockie to the stage, who's one of our young adults who was there. Why don't you make him feel welcome? So the GLS, I've been to a couple now, and it was one of the best ones I've ever been to. Um, And it was a great day of leadership uh, input. So, Lockie, what was what was one thing that you enjoyed? Can't go past the food. <laughs> <laughs> nah, <laughs> gammon. Nah, just the fact that we could have the have the opportunity to talk and listen to so many different leaders around the world, seeing their perspectives and their way of thinking and their way of leading. If you still, if you weren't able to make it yesterday, I do invite you to come next year, because. The skills that we do develop from it, we can use in any form of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what was one thing that you found challenging? Because it's like eight, eight or something sessions, it's all challenging. What was something that stood out for you? Uh, the first talk by Craig Rochelle, with the permission to obsess. It just, he went from what do we obsess about and then how committed are you from a scale from one to ten? You're not fully committed. And he's like, why aren't you? That's the most challenging thing I got from yesterday. Absolutely. And it sounds like you've got a lot out of it. What's one thing that you're going to take away, if you can name it? 100%. Finding what I truly obsess about, prioritizing and fully committing to that one obsession. Isn't that awesome? Thanks so much, Lockie. Appreciate it. Isn't it awesome? We've got young adults that are on fire for developing their own leadership and being involved in the church and the, and the community that we've got. So it's so exciting. Um, I believe that that wraps up the notices and I'd like to invite Pastor Claire to the stage who's going to bring the message. Oh, yes. And we'll release the people who are going to Pathways. Oh, and sorry, before we do get into it, we're going to give you two minutes um, to... <laughs> To just say hi. Oh, you can stay here. We can chat to me. Um, But we'll give you two minutes to say hi and greet each other, and then we'll get into it. So if you're with Pathways, you can make your way out now. Well, why don't you close your eyes. Uh, Feel free to reach out a hand um, as we pray for Pascal this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to uh, thank you for the word that you've put um, on Claire's heart, God. We just thank you for how you've been at work during the week. Uh, as we continue in this Unlikely Hero series, we just pray that um, our hearts would be uh, open to, to hear from you this morning, God. We pray that there would be less of Claire and more of you, and that we would have a fresh revelation of these heroes in the Bible, God. We pray that you'd use her words, and that you'd be speaking to us. We pray this all in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Isaiah. Um, We did have a great day yesterday, and I have shared before how I love a to-do list, but yesterday I was encouraged to have a to-don't list, so um, so that'll be one of my challenges. But it is a privilege to bring the word to you um, today. So John MacArthur um, wrote a book titled 12 Unlikely Heroes. Some of you may have read it, 
And in it, he writes, the men and women we read highlighted in the Bible were unnervingly real. They faltered, they struggled, and at times they fell short. Yet God worked through them in surprising and incredible ways to accomplish his purposes. That is great news for each of us, isn't it? See, as as we start exploring some of these unlikely heroes in the Bible over the next few weeks, we're reminded that God takes ordinary people who make themselves available to do extraordinary things. And last week, Pastor Dan introduced us to the Old Testament character Daniel, who remained faithful to God and discovered that God is faithful. And not only that, that he is the true hero throughout the entire biblical narrative. Now, quite independently from Dan, I had chosen to focus this message on Daniel's companions as unlikely heroes. So I'm just tag-teaming with Dan. So Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, commonly known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if you ever went to Sunday school, you've probably heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You may even have acted out their harrowing encounter with the fiery furnace. My very first recollection of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was performing in the musical back in the 80s, It's Cool in the Furnace. Man, oh man, it's cool. You're just not getting it here. You need to go and watch It's Cool in the Furnace. I was in a secular international primary school on Bougainville Island in the Solomons, and we performed It's Cool in the Furnace. So to briefly set the scene, um, we heard a bit about this last week. We find the account, the account of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azar, um, Azariah in the Bible, in the book of Daniel. If you have a Bible with you, open it up, turn it on. We're going to be mostly in chapters 1 to 3, mostly in chapter 3, so you can follow along. But when we first introduce these characters, it's around the year 605 BC. You may or may not be able to see the timeline, but so we're talking, we're after King David and King Solomon, where the nation of Israel has been divided into the northern kingdom, which was known as Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was known as Judah. And God had warned the king of Judah through the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah that if they didn't turn away from their wicked ways, that he would allow the Babylonians to conquer them and take them into uh, into exile. Unfortunately, they didn't listen, and King Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem, and Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were taken into exile. As teenagers, they were indoctrinated into the Babylonian culture. Can you imagine what this would have been like? Ripped from their homes and their families, all that they knew, they had to learn a new language, adapt to foreign customs, and learn a whole new way of life. Now, we have the benefit of knowing how the story ends. But from the outset, I think that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah qualify as unlikely heroes. For starters, their age was against them. They were teenage boys. I've had two teenage boys. But you know what? In God's hands, age is not a limiting factor. And you may think you're too young or too old to be used by God, but whatever season you find yourself in, don't underestimate what God wants to do in you and through your life. Secondly, they were prisoners of war. Through no fault of their own, these young men found themselves living in their second choice world. Growing up, I'm sure they had dreams and plans, what their career might be, who they might marry, where they would settle down in their retirement. And perhaps you found yourself living in a second choice world. You had dreams and plans, but life has not turned out the way that you thought it would. Through the story of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we can be assured that God is present and at work even in our second choice world. So their age was against them, they were POWs, and then their very identity was threatened. We read this in chapter 1, verse 6. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, 
Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, this was a big deal because names spoke to their identity. You see, the meaning of their Hebrew names was centered on Elohim or Yahweh as the one true God. Daniel's name, Elohim is my judge. Hananiah, Yahweh has been gracious. Mishael, who is like Elohim? And Azariah, Yahweh has helped. To contrast this with their new names, whose meaning centered on the false god that the Babylonians worshipped, Belteshazzar, Bel was the principal god of Babylon, but Bel will protect. Shadrach, inspired of Aku, who is the moon god, Meshach, who is like Aku, Abednego, servant of Nebo, the god of wisdom and literacy. See, these names were meant to reinforce that they were no longer children of God. And perhaps you found yourself in a position where you've been labeled or an identity has been spoken over you that has tried to rob you of your God-given identity as a child of God. But God has called you by name. You are his. See, these young men did not appear to have the makings of a hero, but God loves to take ordinary people who make themselves available to do extraordinary things. So Daniel chapter 3, flick to your Bible if you've got it. We're told that King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 27 meters high. So by my calculations, that's about three times as high as our ceiling here. Okay, we're talking a large golden statue. And he ordered all the officials to come to the dedication of the image. More than that, when they heard the sound of the musical instruments, they were commanded to bow down and worship the image. And if they refused, they were threatened with execution by fiery furnace. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a powerful tyrant. This was not an empty threat. So we read that all the nations and all the peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold. So here we are, chapter 3 of Daniel. Let's start at verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Incredibly, the three men did not have to deliberate about how they would respond to the king's threat. They didn't ask for a time out to discuss it. They didn't form a committee or take a vote. They didn't even need to pray and fast to discern God's will. Why not? The answer is found right back in chapter 1, verse 8. We read this. But Daniel and his friends resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. You see, the three men had resolved beforehand how they would live. That word resolved, sum, means to establish or put in place. When they first arrived in Babylon, they resolved to follow and obey the one true God. That's why they were able to answer the king like they did. Verse 16, this is what they said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. 
They were not being impertinent. They simply meant that they didn't need time to think over their answer. They already knew their response because they were resolved. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. They absolutely believed that God was able to rescue them. Because you see, this wasn't the first time that God's people had been captive in a foreign country. Many years earlier, they'd been slaves in Egypt, and God had miraculously brought them out. Deuteronomy 4.20 describes the Exodus like this. But as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron-smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance, as you now are. You see, God had rescued his people from a powerful empire and a fiery furnace before, so Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah believed that God could do it again. But then they say these powerful words of faith. Verse 18, but even if he does not, we believe he can rescue us, But even if he chooses not to, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. See, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they weren't questioning God's ability to save them, but his willingness according to his sovereign purpose. You know, as young men, they were among those who were deported to Babylon. But since then, they had seen Nebuchadnezzar's forces deport more Jews from Jerusalem, ultimately destroying their city and their temple. They knew from Scripture that all of these things were according to God's sovereign purposes. But since God had not saved Judea and Jerusalem, or even his own temple from Nebuchadnezzar's hand, it would have been presumptuous to assume that God would save them from the king's hand now. So they say, even if God does not rescue us, even if he chooses for us to experience a horrible death of being incarcerated alive, we won't disobey him. They were ready to suffer with no expectation that God would rescue them. They were resolved. So what is it that they had resolved? Firstly, they'd resolved the company they kept. Proverbs 12, 26 says, The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Have you noticed when we read um, about these three men, we always read about them together? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're often also mentioned with Daniel. See, these guys, they were mates. They stuck together. Now, I don't know whether they even knew each other before the exile, but they certainly banded together to support and encourage one another to stand strong in the foreign land that they were taken to. Earlier in Daniel chapter 2, we read about how the king had had some troubling dreams, and he summoned his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers to tell him what they meant. Except he wouldn't tell them what the dream was. I guess he assumed that If he didn't tell them the dream, then they couldn't dream up an interpretation. So when the wise men let him know that this was an unreasonable request, the king ordered their execution, along with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And how did they respond? Well, we read this in Daniel chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They prayed together. When faced with a daunting and impossible situation, they didn't try to face it alone. The friends came together and they prayed. If you're familiar with the story, during the night, God revealed the dream to Daniel, which foretold the future fall of the kingdom and the coming of Christ. Daniel told the king, ensuring that God was given all the glory as the revealer of mysteries. See, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had resolved the company they kept. 
They surrounded themselves with godly friends who would encourage them, support them, and help them stand in the midst of the trials they would face. How about you? Do you have godly friends who can walk beside you through the ups and the downs of life? If not, ask God to send you a friend. And who might you be that friend for? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they resolved the company they kept, and they also resolved the choices they made. Now, I can be super resolved on some things. For example, I have resolved that I will never get my ears pierced. I've also resolved that I will never drink a cup of coffee. Sorry, people who enjoy the coffee, never going to have a cup of coffee. And then there's, there's other times when I think I'm resolved, like um, going into a bakery, I'm completely resolved to have a healthy option. So I go in, you know, I'm going to have a warm chicken salad and a bottle of water, a warm chicken salad and a bottle of water, a warm chicken salad and a bottle of water. And then they ask my order and I say, I'm going to have a potato pie and the biggest slab of carrot cake you have, particularly if it has that cream cheese icing and a bottle of water. But you know what? Early on in Babylon, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were faced with a number of situations where they had to choose either to obey God and risk punishment or play it safe, but in doing so, compromise their faith. And the first came where they were assigned their daily food. Would they eat the royal food and wine that God had commanded them not to eat, or would they eat the healthy food that God had told them to eat? Steak or salad, this is not an easy decision. And I'm sure these young men felt pressure to compromise and to fit in. You know, beyond just the food that they ate, and you've probably heard similar arguments, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, or everybody else is doing it. What difference would actually make? You see, these young men had made a choice to obey God. And God blessed their obedience by not only nourishing their bodies, but he gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of learning. And later on, when they were ordered to bow down and worship this golden image, they'd already resolved that they would only serve and worship and pray to the one true God. See, they knew their Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, You shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. To Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they had resolved the choices they made. So they would rather burn than bow. Being resolved about the choices that we make in our lives before we're making them, before we're faced with having to make them, I've found reduces my stress and also the likelihood of making a reactive decision. You know, choices around faith, um, priority of church family engagement, choices around family, you know, how we'll um, we'll discipline our children, around finances in terms of debt and taxes – and even in relationships. I know when Adam and I started dating, we really wanted to honour God in all areas of our relationship, including our physical relationship. So we resolved beforehand where the boundary lines would be. And I'm so glad that we'd resolved this beforehand, because I'm just saying, Adam is mighty fine. (laughs) And he comes home today, praise God. Um... (laughs) But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they resolved the company they kept and the choices they made because ultimately they had resolved the object of their confidence. You see, the prophet Jeremiah, he wrote in chapter 17, verse 7 and 8, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They'll be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green, it has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had resolved that their confidence was in God. It wasn't in their own ability 
or in the army or in the government. Their trust and their dependence was in God. In the New Testament book of Hebrews in chapter 11, we read this. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And what follows is this incredible chapter highlighting unlikely heroes who lived out their faith in extraordinary ways. In fact, the Calvary staff are focusing on this chapter all this term. And at the end of the chapter, we read this from verse 32. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, we're talking about Daniel there, who quenched the fury of the flames, that's referring to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. You see, for these young men, their confidence was in God. But then they faced this challenging decision that put their faith to the ultimate test. They knew that God was a consuming fire. But they also knew that Nebuchadnezzar's threat of being cast into the furnace was real. So they chose to face this pagan king's consuming fire rather than God's divine consuming fire. You know, faith in God does not necessarily mean that everything goes our way. But to these men, the outcome was irrelevant. For what was at stake was not God's ability or even their own lives, but their faith and obedience to serve God regardless of the cost. No matter the outcome, their resolve was firm. Where does our confidence lie? As believers, how can we acquire a similar ability to face challenges without compromising our witness for God? As we grow deeper in our understanding and acceptance of God's sovereignty, we can trust that whatever comes our way is in accord with God's timing and his will for our lives. I don't find this easy to understand or to accept. But in my wrestling, I've come to a place of resolution. That it's enough just to know that God loves me and he's good. Author and disability advocate Johnny Erickson Tata, who we actually heard from at the GLS, she became a quadriplegic age 17 after a diving accident. And she writes in her book, A Place of Healing. God has different purposes for his own. And he shows himself strong and gains glory in different ways throughout each of our lifetimes. And if he allows suffering in our lives, he does for very specific, very important reasons. And he does not do so lightly. So having defied the king... As you can imagine, Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And in his rage, he ordered the furnace to be heated as hot as possible. And then he commanded the soldiers to tie up these three men and throw them into the blazing furnace. And it was so hot that the soldiers themselves were killed while they were throwing these men in. Can you imagine what it was like for these three men as they were marching toward with every step closer to the furnace, their opportunity for rescue became less. And at some point, they probably resigned themselves to the fact that God would not rescue them. God had chosen option B, and the men likely braced themselves for a horrible death. We read that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. As you see, God has not promised to spare us from trials. The Apostle John records Jesus as saying, 
I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Most of us would probably like there to be some obscure verse somewhere in the Bible that went somewhere, something a little bit like this. If you trust me, says the Lord, you will never again endure hardship, never again face adversity and pain. Surely all your days will overflow with comfort and ease and your chocolate will be calorie free. Amen. Wouldn't that be nice? See, most of us want to avoid pain and adversity and we want, maybe even expect, God to shield us from these things too. Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah found themselves in a hopeless situation. Then God stepped in. Quite literally. From Daniel 3, from verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. He was close. Most biblical scholars agree that the fourth person in the fire was probably Jesus, the Son of God, which is exactly what Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2 promised. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. That speaks to identity. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. So Nebuchadnezzar, he approached the opening of the blazing furnace and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came out of the fire, and the satraps and the prefects, governors and royal advisors, they crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. See, these men went into the fire bound, but they came out free. The only thing that was burned was that which had bound them. You see, being spared from the conflict in the first place would have been great. Being spared, rescued from the furnace, that would have been even greater. But being rescued in the furnace, that was the greatest of all. See, these men, they experienced God's power and his presence in a transformational way. What a gift. What a gift. See, God's desire was not to rescue the men from the fire, but rather to rescue them through the fire. Because God has not promised to spare us from trials, but he has promised to be present with us during them. And my experience has been that it's through the trials that I draw closer to Jesus and that I'm even set free from the things that bound me. And because, as King Nebuchadnezzar's response shows, this is all about God's glory and God's renown. Not about Hananiah and Mishael and Azarias. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. See, there is no other God who walks through the fire with his people. And there is no other God who walks through the fire for his people. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, took on the sin and the suffering of humanity at the cross to rescue us ultimately from suffering and death. Author Catherine Marshall writes this, The cross stands as the final symbol that no evil exists that God cannot turn into a blessing. He is the living alchemist who can take the dregs from the slab 
heaps of life. Disappointment, frustration, sorrow, disease, death, economic loss, heartache, and transform the dregs into gold. And when Jesus walked away from his death, he commissioned his disciples to take the gospel, the good news, to the ends of the earth because his blood was spilt to redeem men and women from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. This is the message that we proclaim. Who is the God who's able to rescue out of the fiery furnace? Jesus Christ, who walks through the fire with us and ultimately for us. Chances are you're never going to find yourself, your faith, tested by having to choose between bowing down to a giant image of gold or burning in a fiery furnace. But you will face hundreds of situations where you will make a choice whether to stand up for what you believe in or to bow. Resolve today how you will respond. Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah give us an example of ordinary people who despite everything that was against them, resolved to put their faith and their confidence in God, to live out their faith and to be available for God to do something extraordinary through them. Perhaps you feel ordinary. Perhaps you feel your age and all your circumstances are against you. But can I encourage you to be resolved, to be resolute in living out your faith and in trusting God's sovereign purposes for your life. I want to close by reading those words of the prophet Jeremiah from chapter 17. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to pray this morning for those who find themselves in the fire. Lord, you know the circumstances of their life. So Lord, I pray today, I pray in this moment that you would reveal to them your presence. Because Lord, we know that you promised that we won't go through the fire alone. So Lord, may you draw close to them. Lord, I pray that they would know without a doubt your presence in the midst of the challenge and the trial. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you, that our confidence can be in you. Even when our circumstances are against us, even when we find ourselves in places where our faith is tested, I pray that you would help us to be resolved, to be resolved today, that we will not bow down, that our confidence and our trust and our hope will be in you, that we will worship and pray and serve the one true God. Lord, we resolve today our trust And our confidence is in you. Strengthen us and equip us, Lord, for all that we will face. For your glory and for your renown. In your name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand and join us?
as we fix our eyes on Jesus and worship him as we sing from the inside out. thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame.
is worthy. Hey, Joshua. He calls us into relationship with Him. He promises to be with us in relationship with Him. Do not fear, for I am with you. But we can rejoice always. So be encouraged. Be encouraged, lean into this series. Lean into the messages that are going. If you missed last week's message with Dan, go and read it. Go and listen to it, sorry. Didn't write it down. But as you go, be encouraged. Jesus is with you. He goes with you in joy. We've got morning tea outside, a lovely area. If you are new, grab a coffee. It's on us. And if you desire prayer, Come forward. Oh, be able to pray with you. But as you go, be blessed. Go in the peace and joy and the truth under the name of Jesus. Be blessed.